Roiper, hello, first one in the house today. Nice to see you here. We're going to be talking about some fruit flies, among other things, but mostly fruit flies today. Culturing wingless and or flightless fruit flies. All the things you wanted to know about fruit flies, but were afraid to ask, or didn't know who to ask, or whatever. Had some requests for these uh, fruit fly live stream recently, and last week I unfortunately had to cancel the live stream for some uh, difficulties that occurred. My uh, wife unfortunately stepped on a piece of glass, and it uh, went all the way into her foot, about an inch deep. The entire piece of glass entered her foot, and it was uh, nasty. So of course I canceled the live stream so I could take her to the urgent care and get that looked at and get some stitches in her foot and so on. So that's what uh, canceled the uh, live stream. She's now doing all right. She had to go on a course of antibiotics because the foot started swelling, turning red, that kind of stuff. Got her in the antibiotics, she's doing much better now. She can now drive, not going on any hikes anytime soon, but uh, other than that, she's, she's doing okay. So I'm, I'm glad that uh, we were able to get into the doctor pretty fast once I got home and, and do that. I'm not quite sure she realized how, how serious it was because she had bandaged it up and gotten a little help. My uh, sister was in town and visiting. I was at work. Um, they, they got it all bandaged up and everything and thought it was okay. And then as soon as I got home, she showed it to me. I said, yeah, I want to go to the doctor. <laughs> Can we go to the doctor? And she said, okay. So that's what we did. Um, and she is doing fine now. And good evening, Sean Meister and Gretel. Um, and banjo playing. There is a fighter jet outside, actually. I live near an Air Force base. And so, yes, they, they do a lot of uh, flights out here, and we hear it. We, our house is right under the flight path, so. So. And thank you, everyone, for the well wishes. I appreciate it. I had a lot of them on the YouTube community page when I posted the cancellation, too. And a lot here, a lot on Patreon, and I really appreciate all of them. So, thank you, everyone. And there's Mike Titula in the house. Excellent. Glad to see you here. Welcome. Moon over Miami. The Bug Hub. And yeah, Mitchell, you're right. Um, something like that. A big slice of glass going into the foot. It opens up a lot of space for uh, bacteria. So Dragon Udo, nice to see you here as well. It has been a while. And... So Mike, what's up with your uh, projects? What's go going on lately? Oh, there's there's Sandy. I see Sandy here as well. And Sandy, not only that, you sent the first questions for the day. So I want to make sure I cover those questions about fruit flies. Nature Man, hello. So I'm going to start out with uh, your question, Sandy. Sandy Sizemore says about fruit flies. Uh, first question says, why is it that fruit fly culture seems slimy after a couple weeks, like on the sides of the cup and on the excelsior? Am I doing something wrong and should I toss it at that point? I guess it kind of depends on what you mean. One thing I've noticed about fruit flies is that your individual conditions in your house are going to influence widely exactly how things work because humidity and airflow that kind of stuff are going to influence things a lot. This culture, this culture I started on the 23rd of May, as you can see here. I always put the labels on there so I don't mess that up. Um, this culture has a little bit of goo, if you want to call it that, coming up the sides and into the excelsior. Is that the kind of thing you mean? Because that's pretty normal. But if you've got like a scum covering up the the excelsior up here in the top, I would say that's not normal. Uh, and if it does cover up the uh, excelsior up here, this, this uh, slime you're talking about, I would probably start over in that case. But if it looks something like this, I, w I wouldn't worry about it. This is pretty normal for, a, for an almost a month old culture. And Mo Centena, does smoking the devil's lettuce disturb the air surrounding the flies and could it potentially harm them? You know, I honestly have no idea. It's a pretty good question, but I, I don't know. And Acadia Territory. Hello. Doing some fruit fly cultures right now. Excellent timing then. 
and Kerm, hello. William, hello. And Zero Shine, Siltman George, cool. I give a shout out to Siltman George. Ruddy Castro, top scorer in the Prem next year, cool. Do the fruit fight culture smell, Banjo? Um, let's see. Honestly, without opening the lid, I can't smell anything in there. I mean, it is a vented lid, so I would assume that it would smell pretty bad. I mean, if you open it, it's going to smell a lot uh, more. You know, you're going to notice some kind of odor, but it's not that bad. It's not like, uh, you know, microworm culture or something like that. I'm going to tap the lid off here, take a sniff. You know, it smells mostly, this particular culture smells like uh, methylparaben, which is an additive that uh, retards mold. That's mostly what that smells like to me. Um, so, Sandy had another question. Does everybody really throw away the cultures after four weeks as recommended by many to not get mites or to not let them spread? I usually let them go a little longer. Um, I try to get close to a month, but it's not always exactly a month, and I have, you know, if the culture is still producing, I'll keep it a little bit of distance away from the other cultures and call it good. Let it go for a little while. So, hopefully that helps. Great question, Sandy. I always appreciate it. You're good about posting questions on Patreon, and I really, really appreciate that. Helps give me some content to go on right from the get-go, which I really appreciate. Oh, okay, so Mo said it does disturb colonies of most insects. You're wondering how feeble the organism react to it. Oh, okay. It's actually super easy, Mitchell, to, to do a new culture. I'm going to do some right here on live so everybody can see how it works. Um, I thought that would be a nice idea. Cassandra says, can't wait. Having many small toadlets starting on fruit flies, I desperately desire all your knowledge. Would love to know the basic schedule for feeding so it doesn't crash the culture and how many flies can come out of a standard culture. Um, great questions. So, um, I would say that once you have the culture actually producing, and this, di this differs from Melanogaster, the smaller uh, flies on my right here. Those are Melanogaster, Drosophila Melanogaster. I have the Apteris, the completely wingless variety, and there are others. Uh, there's a flightless variety that has wings called the Turkish Glider by some people, that kind of stuff. Um, they generally, once the culture starts producing, there's a really high number and you can start feeding off right away and preferably feed every day for that culture. Um, don't feed everything off. Don't feed all the flies. But if you're feeding every day from that culture, it's going to have a better life. It's going to last longer. You're going to get le fewer problems with the medium, that kind of stuff. With uh, Heidi, I, I would give the ones on the left here, which are uh, flightless but not wingless, I would give them a little more time. Uh, once they produce, give them maybe 48 hours or so because males and females emerge at different times and you want to give them a little bit more time before you start feeding off. But once you have actually started that, you can do the same thing and feed off every day, but don't feed all of them. And how many flies can come out of a standard culture like this, this size of deli cup? I think this is the 64 ounce deli cup. Am I right? Or is this the, no, this is the 32 ounce deli cup. Um, whoa, how many flies can come out? Hard to, to count. I mean, hard to even say. You can safely harvest like from the Melanogaster, at least 100, 200 flies a day in its peak producing time. And probably f a little, somewhat fewer than that in the high DI. But uh, I hope that helps, Cassandra. This is a great, great question, great comment. Okay, I'm going to scroll back a little bit. So, um, can you eat the flies? Well, I've never tried that, at least not on purpose. And what am I using for the cultures of Acadia Territory? I've used a lot of different mixes, at least several. I've used uh, any Herpeticultures mix, which I like. I've used Josh's Frogs, which I like. I use Rapashi, which I like. This is my own mix that I'm using right now, and I'm going to show everybody what it is. Uh, so I do it because it's cheap, it's easy, and it works. Um, so that's, that's basically what I do. Um, so I guess that's answering... Um, a couple of questions of different people. It's answering the Bug Hub's question too. Ben's Bugs here as well. So, so Dragonudo uses them about 28 days. Yeah, okay. How fast do they reproduce? Depends on the variety, depends on the temperature. So Milano's are a little bit faster. You usually get, uh, it can be approximately a week, it can be a little bit more longer depending on temperature like 
in in the sweet spot is right around 75 degrees Fahrenheit you can go a little higher a little lower of course um, you don't want to get a whole lot over 80 and I don't in the summers this room gets to about 78 Fahrenheit and it takes about a week ish maybe a little more than that maybe a couple more days than that for the colony from when you seed it until you have a ton of flies coming out Heidi I takes longer several more days more like 10 days to two weeks for the Heidi I and in the winter when it's 68 degrees in here or 70 degrees in here it's slower it slows down quite a bit so it might take two three weeks even for the Heidi I if it's pretty cold and the Milano's are still you know a little faster than that so Ben's Bugs, that is a great question about Porcelio Hossi Giant. I would assume they require the same care, but I can't say a whole lot about it because that is one species of giant Porcelio isopod that I honestly have never kept, and I'm hesitant to say a whole lot about it for that reason. I don't uh, have that on my permit. I would love that species. I absolutely adore that species. In fact, it's probably, if I had to pick my favorite giant Porcelio species, that would be a contender. I'm not saying it's necessarily my very favorite, but... It's certainly a contender, so I wish I could tell you more about it. Okay, so. Yeah, entomophagy mo, mo is uh, pretty common. I've actually tasted insects of various types. And, okay, Cassie, it did help. Great. And Roddy, you don't actually have to worry a whole lot if your son ate a fruit fly. <laughs> So, ah, oh, Sandy, that's a good question. The self-clean in your kitchen oven, or do the fumes bother the small fruit flies, isos, morning geckos? I would just say, um, make sure, in our house, I don't have to worry about it a ton. We have swamp cooler in the summer, and so the house is extraordinarily well ventilated. With If you had AC, that might be different. But, so, you know what I'm saying? Um, <laughs> I don't know if I can answer that question very well because I haven't had to deal with it. So it is a great question, but I'm not sure what to say. Um, yeah, and we, I would worry about it more with our bird, honestly, than I would about the, the um, other critters. So, let me start the fruit fly culturing uh, right now. Why not, right? Okay, well, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to put labels on these. Like I said, I always, always get the, the labels going. Here's my Heidi Eye label. Put the date on there. Um, there's not a big difference in the medium. Sometimes I will put a little bit more of the nutritional yeast in the uh, Heidi Eye because they do like a little more protein. But I find that I just go a little bit high on the protein sources in both of them. They do fine. So I'm not too concerned about it, to be honest. Um, I feel like they do better when I add additives to both of them that increase the protein. That's kind of what I do. So, so bottled earth. Is there any feeder or combination of feeders that could replace fruit flies? Depends on the species. Um, I would say, you know, um, you can work with pinhead crickets. You can work with Mm, fl confused flower beetles and they can kind of take the place of fruit flies to some extent I'm not sure they're gonna work in all cases for all situations but my understanding is that dart frog the dart frog hobby actually uh, before fruit flies were a thing people were using uh, the confused flower beetles as one of the bigger at least some people were using the confused flower beetles as like the staple food source for dart frogs supplemented but that's what they were doing. And I, I don't know how widespread that was or whatever, but I've heard that that was the case for some keepers and that it was working for them as long as they were supplementing them enough. So that's interesting. Uh, I wouldn't have thought that, to be honest. Okay, so... The D's colony? I have not heard of that. So banjo playing, um, that's a great question. Do I put the uh, expired flies into another culture to keep them breeding? Actually, I do not. It's a great question. But let's talk about it. 
So, um, I culture the flies from a fairly new culture that has just started producing fairly recently because you're less likely to get mites that way. And, uh, yeah, that's mainly the reason why I do it that way. Also, the flies are going to be a little more healthier. Uh, more healthier. They're going to be more healthy in a new culture. So, uh, that's why I do that. Those two reasons. Okay, so right now I'm going to put a small amount of methylparaben powder in both cultures. This is uh, a mold inhibitor. I bought mine from Josh's Frogs. Here's the methylparaben in case you're wondering how it's spelled. Methylparaben from Josh's Frogs. This stuff is, from, if I understand it correctly, it's like a, it's an extract from certain kinds of fruit or something like that, or blueberries or something. I'm not sure exactly. But it's a naturally occurring mold inhibitor is what it says on the package. And it helps reduce issues with mold, which can be a big issue in um, fruit flies. Um, so that's, that's why I do that. So that's in there. And bean beetles, that's another one. I haven't cultured bean beetles in a while, but I have done it. I used to do it a lot. Um, bean beetles can replace fruit flies to some extent as well. So now I'm putting in nutritional yeast. I just get this in bulk at the grocery store, usually. You can use uh, brewer's yeast, which is different. This is, neither of these is anything, is not, well, it's not the same thing as like dry, the baker's yeast. It's not active. And it is nutritionally somewhat different, even though it's, I believe, the same species, but it's grown on different substrates and has a different purpose. Um, so there we go. Okay. Sorry, I'm I'm not Sorry, I'm not being able to catch up all that well with the chat as I'm trying to focus on the, the fruit fly cultures, but Oh yes, arthropod ambassadors. I remember talking to you about that once and I think that's an excellent idea. You can uh, freeze the extra flies and to feed to other colonies like isopods. I've been thinking of trying that with my uh, blue death fanning beetles ever since we talked about that. I thought that was a great idea you brought up. And right now I'm putting spirulina powder in there. Here's an interesting thing about spirulina. I put just a little bit in once, and I'm probably putting a little bit more in, honestly, than I usually do. Put just a little bit in once, um, a long time ago, just for, you know, it's got various nutrients in it. And then, um, then I got some other, uh, I accidentally dumped too much in a culture and the culture did incredibly well. So I usually do a little bit more than I, than I would. Okay. All right, trying to catch up. Teeny white dots on the side of the fruit fly cups. I think the we are seeing waste of uh, fly waste. Yeah, I think that's what they. That's what that that's coming from. So, um, confused flower beetles. Um, we refers to the fact that. The species name was confused originally. Um, that, that's my understanding of how that works. Um, the taxonomists were confused. The beetles weren't confused themselves. Uh, they weren't exhibiting confused behavior. It was just a scientific taxonomy issue, <laughs> from what I understand. So, so basement pets. You're getting fruit flies from Josh's frogs. I'd just say go with it the way it is. I've purchased cultures from them directly just like they are and, and like them like that. So I mix this up pretty well. I prefer to mix it up uh, fairly well, both while it's dry and after. So I'm going to do that here. 
mix these up pretty well. And now you notice I try to keep these cultures separate. Um, I think that's kind of important and I usually uh, use some hand sanitizer to help kill any mites. I guess there they could be eggs, but I think the most of the eggs are going to be in the substrate. Haven't had um, bofa ants at all. Okay, so next step in this culture. Sorry, I'm going to have to depart. I forgot an important piece of equipment. I'll be right back. Okay. And still trying to find the chat and yeah I, thank you again for that tip uh, arthropod ambassadors that's great I love it so now I'm going to put some water in this is not just water just so you know it's water with a little bit of um, brown sugar dissolved in it I like to do that it seems to be useful and then I've noticed that I really stir this up if I really, really stir this up, it helps mix the methylparaben and the other things, of course, in there. And I'm just going to pour a little bit more water in there. Sometimes you need a little more, sometimes a little less. It's not an exact science, but it uh, you want to get this the medium so it is moist, not soaked, um, not too dry, but not, not really wet. I'd rather have it a little too dry than a little too wet. And initially it looks very, very wet. But after just a couple of moments of stirring, it starts to solidify. If you let it stay too wet, you're going to have problems later. So you can see that's already kind of stiffening up. And this one's really stiffened up. It's already pretty solid. This one is getting there. And to be honest, I did put a little bit more um, spirulina in there than I thought I did. So just keep that in mind. It's not going to be a huge problem or anything. Like I said, when I put extra spirulina in there, it's usually a good thing. Um, oh, coat the containers you're adding the fruit flies to before feeding with the multivitamins so they can't climb the sides. That is that is helpful. That's a that's a great idea. Oh, bottled earth. Yeah. Dealing with mites, not fun stuff. Let me see. I just had, where's my yeast? Did I drop it or something? I just had some baker's yeast in a little deli cup here. And now I'm not seeing it. What did I do with it? Huh, that's weird. Had it all ready to go. And now I don't. Well, the nice thing about that is the baker's yeast is kind of optional because the, the flies themselves are going to be adding live yeast from their feet because the yeast is going to be growing in the culture and so these older cultures are going to have some in there so the flies are going to be adding some so it's not a huge deal i went years without actually adding any and so w marion the uh, hand sanitizer because it's alcohol can dry out really small little critters like mites. seems to help um, avoid transmission i'm not going to say it kills all the mites but it probably does help um, Okay. I'm going to put in a little bit of Excelsior now, which is shredded aspen fiber. I usually put a piece in that's about the same size, somewhere between a uh, tennis ball and an orange size, something like this. I like to put it in a kind of a ball it up a little bit, like a snowball just at first, because then it's less likely to fall out in bits later. So, I, some people do it really, really thick, like really dense, and some people don't. I kind of like to do it not too dense because then it saves on the stuff, and you think about it. The reason why it's there is mostly surface area for the flies, and if you pack it too tightly, they're not going to be able to use all the little gaps in between. So, I just put it in sort of, 
put in a good bit, but I don't pack it super, super tight. But I don't think it matters all that much, to be honest. It just saves me a little bit of, uh, you know, money because I'm not using it up too fast. So after a cup has expired, Banjo Player, a couple things you can do, but mostly I just throw mine away, to be perfectly honest. Or I feed it to my chickens, not the, the medium, but I open the culture and put it on the outside of the fence and the flies come and just eat them. So, so after the cup has expired, basically you don't set up the culture after it's expired. You take a culture like this. This is a culture that I had made on the 6th of this month, okay? So it's a couple of weeks old, it's producing pretty well. And I'm gonna open it up, tap the top so that flies don't get out, and then, until I want them to. And I'm just gonna tap a few in here. I'm gonna go for maybe, you know, just ballpark figure, maybe 50 flies, cap it, okay? Now, this culture is two weeks old or so. It's gonna last me quite a lot longer. I'm gonna feed off that for a couple more weeks, but this culture now has started before the other one has expired. I always have several going. I usually start a different culture every week, so every week I can throw away an old culture, start a new culture, and then be feeding off of one or two cultures that are producing of each species, and then have one or two spe one or two cultures that are not quite producing yet, but are just about to be. So you see what I mean? I have a whole shelf that's just fruit flies when I'm, I'm doing this. So if I make a uh, culture of each type every week, I, I never run out. Sometimes I'll make more than that. Hopefully that helps. And yeah, W. Marion, the mites are really super annoying. Have to agree with you there. And uh, I've had them with grindleworms, and I actually have a video about that, about dealing with mites in grindleworm cultures. This culture is a little bit older and drier. I'm going to put, once again, about 50-ish flies in there. Let's close the lid. You can see that there's, well, try not to touch the cultures. I try to do that to keep mites uh, down. I don't really have problems with mites, to be honest. I've been doing this for years. I think it has to do with a few things. One may be that I live in a pretty dry climate, so the mites don't have much of a chance to get to the other cultures, but also because I culture them on wire shelves, and the wire shelves seem to be a little bit harder for the mites to cross. And, hmm, yeah, something like that. So hopefully that helps Banjo. Basement pets, do I have links on where to buy all the supplies? I do, I think, on my fruit fly video, my fruit fly culture video, which is old. You know, it's, it's an older video. It has a different medium that I'm using, uh, than I'm using now. But yeah, I do have one. And it, uh, I think I have some links to some of the supplies in there. And Marlin and Aquarius, those are good tips too. Is there a way to prevent mass die off? Um, they're a pot hunter. One of the best ways to prevent die-off of fruit fly cultures, in my experience, is make sure to feed often. Feed often. Um, meaning feed the fruit flies off often. You don't want the fruit fly colony to build up uh, huge numbers. Kind of like this one on the left is questionable. I need to start uh, feeding off that one uh, pretty soon. And you, if you are feeding off some of the flies every day, that's going to really help. <coughs> and then the other thing I would say is just make sure you are also doing, as I mentioned, uh, make a new culture every week. Throw away an old culture every week. Then you're going to have several cultures. You're never going to worry that, oh, all my fruit flies just died because you've got three or four different cultures going at any given time in various states of development. So that helps a lot. And Gretel. I have kept mantis of various types. Uh, maybe three or four different species of mantis. And I love them. I don't have any right now, but I have had them. So banjo playing grape. I've heard people clean these cups. I don't. They tend to get brittle after a while and crack. Uh, and they are also kind of hard to clean. So I don't. I have used other, I've used glass jars to culture them too. And you can do that and then clean those out. You give them a good soak before you do it. So that can be done. Um, I feel like uh, it can be done and some people do, some people don't. It's just kind of a you know personal preference thing, I guess.
Yeah, the, the culture on the left, this one, I, uh, the high DI I just put in to this culture. And yeah, this one really needs to be uh, harvested from. I should feed somebody. We're going to see who's, who's ready for a snack. Um, probably my, uh, let's see, who needs a snack right now? Probably my morning geckos and my uh, dart frogs be ready for some. I don't think uh, my pseudoscorpions need this size of fruit fly, otherwise I would do that. And glad to hear it, Ben's bugs. They are learning some stuff from the videos. Um, Snailentologist, are superworm beetles suitable for desert, um, desert terrariums? Let's see. I, I think you could probably get away with it if you have a place where they can get enough moisture. Um, I keep my superworm adults fairly dry, and I, I think they could. I think they could do that. Uh, just it depends on the heat and the dryness and stuff. But they tend to like warmth, and they tend to like it fairly. You know, they're pretty adaptable, and they can handle some dryness. So I'm going to feed off some of these flies here. I don't know if you can see what I'm doing. Hopefully, you can. It can be a little bit tricky working with the camera and other things in your hands, of course. I'm going to tap these down. Give some of these flies to uh, my morning geckos in a little while. The nice thing about these uh, containers is that the Heidi eye flies can't get through these little holes. I wouldn't really trust the melanogaster, but the Heidi eye can't get through it. So I'm going to be feeding those off soon. <laughs> Sean needs a snack too. Probably not the same kind though. So, Bottle Earth, do you know any good places to buy reasonably priced morning geckos? What would you consider a reasonable price? I do sell them. I'm probably not going to be selling any for a little while because it's too hot. But I sell mine for $25 each. Uh, so, W. Mary, in the book that is highly recommended for live cultures out of print, you should consider filling the gap. You can buy my book on live food cultures on Amazon. Um, it's an e-book, but you can buy it. The Aquarimax Guide to Seven Easy Live Foods. It actually, uh, I don't know that it predates my YouTube channel, but I was writing it a long time ago before anybody knew about my YouTube channel and wrote it a long time. So, uh, yeah, it's definitely out there. So this is an interesting thing, Mitchell. You saw a baby praying mantis on the front door. And it had wings and could fly well. Well, no praying mantis has wings when it is a baby. They all can only have wings when they're adult, if they're going to have wings at all. Some species don't have wings at all, or they have rudimentary wings and can't fly at all. But there are no species that have fully developed wings when they fly. You may have seen uh, mantispid, uh, which is a species of insect that looks a lot like a mantis, but can fly and is much smaller. I mean, not that mantids can't fly, but... You know what I mean. Um, it's a type of flying insect that resembles a mantis. It could be that. It's possible. Or it could have been a very small mantis, I suppose. It kind of depends on where you saw it. It, it missed the entire time, so you let it go. Well, that's probably good right now. If fruit flies couldn't climb plastic, the world would be a better place. Uh, I, could, I can see that. Yeah, if uh, one of the mods wants to do a... wants to look up that link and put it in, we could. Oh, four inches long. Okay, four inches long is cool. Um, then that, I would not say a baby. That is probably an adult if it's four inches long. Maybe a male, uh, perhaps, but definitely uh, an adult. Yeah, isn't that funny how they do the distance thing? I wonder what that what that's about. If they there's some sort of unwritten fly cultural etiquette thing where they're distancing from each other. I don't know. So it's it's good that you bring that up though, because it's kind of cool to watch, isn't it? So um, one thing I would like to talk about. Um, well, even three inches, that's going to be uh, still an adult mantis, but it's got wings, but still, that's, 
That is not the biggest mantis you'd ever see. I, I've seen adult males that size, so that's it's very likely that's what you had there. Uh, I would say fruit flies. I had a, a couple of points to bring out. We have both wingless and, and flightless fruit flies in culture. Um, Hydei is only available in a wingless, I'm mean, sorry, a flightless variety. It has wings, but the wings have vestigial muscles or, you know, there's something that doesn't allow the muscles to work. So the wings are perfectly good otherwise, but the muscles don't work. So they don't fly. I have had occasional ones that were able to fly a little bit, whether that they were throwbacks or whatever, but I don't have problems with that anymore. It could have been just a wild one got in there and uh, interbred with the others because most of these uh, genes that produce wingless and fright, flightless mutations are recessive, if not all of them. But I haven't had problems with that for a long time. The uh, Apteris or wingless varieties, the Melanogaster has a wingless variety, it has a vestigial winged variety, and then it has uh, the Turkish glider variety which has fully developed wings but can't really fly, but it can sort of hop an inch or so at a time. And they buzz with their wings. Those are kind of annoying in my opinion, so I don't culture those anymore. Um, some of the predators like them a lot because they buzz and jump around, but I'm not a big fan. Oh, thar sorry to hear about your ivory millipedes there, Pot Hunter. Gretel, uh, I recommend for fish food pellets, you can actually use a lot of different kinds of fish food pellets. My personal favorite that I use a lot is Omega-1. Works great, but I've used others. I've used Hikari, I've used uh, Wardleys, I've used whatever. But I like Omega-1, and my ice buds love it. And good point, arthropod investors. Some of the uh, male mantids don't get very big at all. There are some dwarf mantids that are very small, but even orchid mantids, yeah, the male doesn't get very big. Well, Mitchell, no problem. There's no, uh, no shame in that. Just... Uh, you're a bug enthusiast, that's a great thing. And you're, and you're learning, which is also a great thing, so no worries. No worries at all. Well, let's see. Are there any other fruit fly questions? I'd like to show you all something that's entirely unrelated, if you want to see it. But uh, just figure we're here, why not? You know what I'm saying? Just thought I'd show you one of the proud fathers of my little garter snakes uh, that were recently born. He's, he's looking pretty good. You can see some red on his sides there, hopefully. I don't know if it's showing up in the light for you in the camera, but I hope it does. Have I ever added an ingredient that didn't work out, Arthropod Ambassadors? I'm trying to think. Um, I no longer add pea powder, but I, it works fine. I just don't add it, and I'm not sure why I don't add it anymore. I just don't, but it, it worked fine when I did. Um, and I, I used to add other ingredients. I used to use vinegar instead of vinegar and cinnamon as mold retardants, natural mold retardants, instead of uh, the methylparaben, and it works fine too, but I don't really like the smell combination. And... I think the methylparaben works a little better, so that's what I do now. Um, so yeah. And Matt M, hello. And Cassie, was the white stuff in the beginning mashed potato flakes? Yes, I may have forgotten to mention that, but it, it was indeed mashed potato flakes. And thank you, Arcadia Territory. This is Rufus, named for his red markings, which I love. I don't know how well you can actually see the red or not. Me being, you know, I'm partially colorblind and I, uh, the lighting's gonna be different and look different on my screen than it does for you, so I'm not sure what you're seeing, but. Uh, he's fun, I, I like him a lot, and I think he's pretty beautiful. Maybe I should show you one of the babies. You guys, you all wanna see one of the babies? It's been a couple of weeks since you saw the babies. The babies are almost a month old now. So they've been shedding and doing all kinds of things lately. Let me see if I can get them out without causing a huge mess because of the water dish. Um, I just refilled their water dish right before the stream and uh, don't want to you know, make a big puddle in their paper toweling. Oh, there's some fresh sheds in here. 
There's how many? Wow, there's a ton of them. They just shed. Everybody shed since yesterday or the day before. Um, let's, I think, when did I clean this out? I cleaned it out yesterday. So, yeah, a whole bunch of sheds in here. Let me see if I can find a snake, though, that'll come out. Here. Just want to show you these sheds. Shed baby garter snake sheds that I just took out. Going to make some isopods real happy there. Um, take out one of the little snakes. The lovely thing about this species is their docility. They don't like being approached from the top. That's just, you know, an instinctual safety thing. Because being approached from the top is usually pretty bad news when you're a tiny little snake. But once they, once I pick them up, they're happy. They're really pretty happy. So they'll, they'll relax and, and do their thing most of the time. So here's one right here. It's just uh, pretty peaceful. What's my opinion on using coffee filters and fruit fly cultures instead of Excelsior? I've used both. Both work totally fine. I probably spent several years using the coffee filters before I even messed with Excelsior. And I prefer Excelsior a little bit, but I don't have a huge preference. I mean, they both work fine. So I just, I don't know what it is. I think sometimes it's easier for the, the Excelsior to wick up too much moisture, cause problems. So that happens. But yeah, that's what I would say. And Gretel, my new blue death winning beetles are breeding like wild, but my terrarium isn't hospitable for the larva to develop. So what will happen if them if I don't interfere with the larva just die in the substrate? Most likely, Gretel, and they they will probably be eaten by the adults. And they will also cannibalize each other to some extent. So that's probably what will happen in there unless you take them out. Ooh. Saw the Mitchell saw the wasp nest with a Saw the queen. Interesting. Oh, Arcadia Territory. Which uh, type of garter do you have? Well, Arthropod Ambassadors, we might be able to make that happen. I'm, I'm still not entirely sure. I mean, uh, as far as the waiting list goes on these garters, I might be... This, this clutter might be gone. I'm not sure entirely yet because I haven't heard back from a couple of people confirming stuff, but um, there might be some left and, and there might not, but if there aren't I think I might get a fall clutter too. Is it possible to make a night crawler bin to culture for live food? Well, Cassie, uh, yes and no. Um, generally, night crawlers do not fare well indoors, if you're talking about indoors. You can definitely culture them outside, but generally they have to be able to access actual underground to some extent. Um, I don't know if you can see the color on this one or not. But you can see it's very calm. Um, they tend to need really cool temperatures. So it is difficult to culture them indoors. There are some worms though, not true night crawlers, but the uh, Indian blue worms, I think they're called, and the uh, the red wigglers, you can culture them. You don't want to culture red wigglers for garter snakes because they make them sick. Uh, but you can culture uh, the, I think the Indian blue worms are okay for garters. I'm not entirely sure. Um, I just usually use night crawlers for mine or worms that I get from a spot in my yard where I know I don't have to worry about pesticides because we don't spray our yard and it's far enough away from other yards that it's pretty protected. So that's what I do. Um, and Matt M, I have fed my fish fruit flies. In fact, I think that's why I started culturing them was for my fish the first time I did it, but that was years and years ago, so I'm not entirely sure. But uh, they are a great food for a lot of surface feeding fish of various sizes. Guppies love them. Um, my goldfish have loved them, that kind of thing. So, yeah, it's they're, they're great for most surface feeding fish, killifish, that kind of thing. So the best way to keep the cultures alive is basically keep them at a good temperature, feed from them frequently. If you have extra fruit flies, then freeze them so that you're not just letting them sit in the culture and overcrowd it. And that really helps. 
So Acadia Territory, these garters, most of them are now on unscented. Whoa, sorry, just kicked the tripod right there. Most of the garters are on unscented pinky parts. So meaning I'm not mixing them with anything else and not, I don't have to use earthworms or anything to, to scent them. Most of them. I've got five females that are a little pickier and they are now on earthworm mixed with pinky parts. So finely minced uh, pinky parts and, and earthworms. I, I had to use endlers for a while to get them to eat, but I don't have to do that so much anymore. Um, so they can eat small fish, like the endlers, like I was saying, when they're this size. Uh, they can also eat small earthworms or chopped night crawlers, as well as the chopped pinkies. And there are other things they could eat too, of course, but that's, that's what I've used, those three foods. Um, I wouldn't use minnows because minnows tend to contain thiaminase and that's uh, bad news for garters over a long period of time. It won't hurt them once in a while, but if that's a steady part of their diet, then that will destroy all the thiamine, an important B vitamin in their diet, and they will eventually uh, have neurological issues and then die from it. So I wouldn't use minnows as a staple diet, but it doesn't do any harm to feed them occasionally in a, in a varied diet. Well, oh, CS, well, congratulations on the baby. And glad that you're back. Oh, the Lake Chapala garters are really cool. I got to see some the other day in person, and they are very cool. The Lake Chapala garters are kind of a stocky garter with sort of a blue-green color to parts of them. They're really neat. Oh, betas love fruit fries, definitely. Yeah, they really are very personal, Cypher, Cypher Fox. Um, the only time I've ever been musked by the garters I have now was right after my female gave birth, like the day after or something. I think she was really stressed because they had never done that before, none of them. And she did then. I think I accidentally scared her. And uh, that's what happened. But other than that, they've been really great. Not must, not must at all. And I've had them for, I don't know, how much has it been? How long has it been? Has it been almost three years or almost two years? Not entirely sure. I'll have to go back and look at my videos and figure that out. Look, this is, the snake is so chill. It's got kind of a, Oh, you can kind of see the colors there, yeah. I, I can, a little bit. If I can a little bit, you probably can more. Yeah. Well, maybe I should put this little one back, huh? I'll be back. That was one of my little males. I have them separated into three bins. I have a an all-male bin, an all-female bin, and then another all-female bin of the ones that are slightly pickier about eating. <gasps> Ooh. <clears throat> Holy cow. Okay. Just one second. I put these guys away. They are tricky. Little tricksters. Be hard to work with. Almost got one caught in the door. Uh, looks like I caught him in time to not to have a problem, but. Okay, there we go. And I'm not getting any blue ones that I have noticed. I haven't seen any with any blue on them from these particular garters. But uh, that would be cool. I've seen some blue garters. They're fantastic. Gorgeous snakes. Okay. So Mark, yeah, I guess I answered that question already. Aquarius, if you could find a snake that stays tiny, you would get one. Well, there are snakes that stay pretty small. Quite a few. Not all of them make terrifically good pets, but there's the uh, flower pot snake, for example. It stays tiny. I saw those in Hawaii. 
they're fantastically interesting but not really great pets. There are things like ringneck snakes or the uh, variable ground snakes stay tiny too. And you're welcome, Acadia Territory, and glad you uh, appreciate it. Raw nature, hello. There's uh, Snake Discovery has some decays brown snakes. Those stay small, too. And uh, they're not terribly frequently kept as pets, but they seem to be doing well for Emily and Ed. Of course, they're really experienced snake keepers, so that makes sense. So this is living proof that uh, snake skins are not a good way to size your snake because they're going to stretch out as they shed and uh, those are considerably larger than the actual snakes. Oh, Isaran channel, hello! And glad to hear you like my videos. Oh, okay, Cypher Fox, you were in, stationed on a sub out of Pearl Harbor for four years, that's awesome. My father-in-law was stationed out of a sub in that same area years and years ago. I think it was less than four years. It was like a year or something. But uh, I was in, on the same island as you. I was on Oahu. I was on the North Shore in La Ie. Oh, Cassie, that's, that's awesome. Done business with them. That, that is so cool. I would love to do a collaboration with, with Emily if she's ever interested in it. I don't know if she would be, both Emily and Ed, both of them. I would be so excited about that. It would be so fun. I love that channel. They're one of the reasons uh, Snake Discovery and Clint's Reptiles are probably uh, one of the reasons, one of the big reasons I got into garter snakes. So, would love that. Maybe she'd want to do an isopod collaboration or something sometime. Someday I'd love to go to their new facility. That'd be pretty neat. I'm excited for my next visit to Clint's Reptiles, which is going to be in a few weeks here. I'm really, really excited for that. I've been there several times already, but it's always a, a huge amount of fun. Really looking forward to it. So millions of critters... You just add some live adult fruit flies to the culture. So you got to have an existing fruit fly culture to start one. Um, you can usually get them at some of the big chain stores, but I don't necessarily recommend that. Um, I think it's better to get them from something like Josh's Frogs or something like that. Or if you know a dart frog culturist uh, who can get them for you. Um, my Milano Gaster cultures, I, I bought... I've, I've restarted a few times in my life um, because I, there, were, there have been times when I haven't cultured them at all. But I've been culturing them, fruit flies of one kind or another, pretty constantly for the past eight years or so. And it is, uh, I think I got them from Josh's Frogs a couple of times. I think the last time I got Melanogaster was from Josh's Frogs, in fact. Well, thank you, Cassie. And of course, no pressure at all. But if they're ever interested, I, I would be excited about it. Yeah, Basement Pets, I, I really hope you get a chance to go to Clint's Reptile Room. It is such a fantastic place. And I've been there. The first time I was there, I was just visiting as, you know, I brought my, my boys to visit and, and check it out. And it's really, really fun. And then the, the last few times I've been there, I've been to record videos, of course, with Clint, do collaboration videos, which is uh, also an amazing amount of fun. And then uh, next time, it's going to be for a visit with my family. I'm going to bring my wife and daughters this time, too, as well as my son. One son's going to be away at school. The other son is going to be there. Really excited about that. And Gretel, I actually have done a collaboration with Peter. Uh, Peter's awesome. And we're actually planning on doing another one fairly soon. We've, we've talked about that, so... Uh, my Orchid Mantis video is uh, basically a, an interview with Peter.
from Bugs in Cyberspace. And I've known Peter for a really long time. And, uh, you know, we chat and things like that and watch each other's videos. And uh, he's awesome. So I'm looking forward to our next collaboration. And hopefully that next collaboration, if all goes well, will actually be on site in Arizona. We'll both be there. So we were going to do a collaboration uh, herping trip. Well, you know, bugging herping trip in uh, southern Utah back in the day. Uh, and then COVID hit and ruined it. But now that things are sort of opening back up, we're going to do another one. So I'm really excited about that. So I do have a videos on uh, cricket care, millions of critters, and I've cultured crickets for many years. And my idea was to culture crickets, not, I don't want to produce thousands of crickets at a time, but maybe just have a few hundred on hand at any given time. And I've done it. I've done it with both banded crickets and house crickets. And it works pretty well if you want to check out my video. It works for both species. That could be helpful. So. Be, uh, could be very useful. And Acadia Territory. I don't have any land snails. They're pretty illegal in my state. Um, there is a, a large species of... Uh, Cornu aspersa, I think it is. It's a European species that is feral here. And I'm not sure of its legal status in my state, but uh, pretty much everything else is. So um, there's not much I can do about that. I do like land snails a lot, and I, I used to keep some as a kid, the Cornu aspersa I was talking about, as well as a native species that lives here up in the mountains that estivates during the summer and lives, you know, it's mostly a spring and, and fall species, activity-wise. It's pretty cool. They're about an inch in size, have mostly white shells, but some of them are brown and some of them have stripes. Pretty cool little snails. Oh, thank you, millions of critters. Happy to be able to help. The video is old, but it still works. Everything in there is current uh, information that will work for you. The only thing that I do very, very differently right now, besides the fact that I'm now culturing banded crickets, uh, is that I use a heat pad, uh, ultra-therm heat mat, underneath the culture with a thermostat on it uh, to keep the culture warm. That's about the only difference. But the other method that I showed in the video works fine, too. So... Sorry, I'm just like watching my snake crawl through here. It's kind of fun. Um, I'm going to put this snake away. And I see another snake poking its head out like it. Maybe expecting a meal, perhaps? Let me see how it's doing here. This is a corn snake. There he is. Yeah, Sean, I really love the red pattern on the... Some of the babies turned out really pretty red, and I'm pretty excited about that. There's some, some that look even redder, but I, I love the red pattern. Totally love it. For some reason, red on snakes is just fantastic. Someday I want to get a corn snake that is uh, an okatee that has really a lot of contrast on it. This one doesn't have a... Tiny, it's a beautiful snake, don't get me wrong, but it doesn't have like the black saddles because it's a hypomelanistic. And the uh, Okatees have very black edges, thick black edges on their saddles and very red color rather than the, the lighter orange on this one. So, it's kind of cool. Um, let's go on forever. That would be awesome. Um, your pixie frog actually eats the dead ones, huh? Well, um, they will often keep dying when they're from the store and you have to kind of get them up to health and get them breeding and then they're fine. But Pygmy python, you know, that has actually intrigued me quite a bit. There are a lot of snakes that intrigue me, so I'm interested in that idea. The pygmy python is not a bad idea. Um, contagious cure. I just, I do, I do love the red. I love the red and the blue and the, I love leucistic. And I love melanistic. Those might be my favorites. Well, we've gone about an hour. And 
Um, I need to kind of close up, but basement pets. Any tips on stuck tail shed? Hmm. So do you have you done a sphagnum moss um, humid hide in there? That often helps with the stuck shed. If you've already done that, I'm not sure what else to suggest, but if you haven't done that, I would suggest it. Um, so Gretel, you love the Silisticus convexus Ukraine pied. Excellent. I'm glad you got those on my suggestion. They are awesome. Um, it's hard to pick my personal top three favorite hobby isopods. However, if I had to pick three, I would probably include Porcelio expansus in that group. Either Porcelio levis milkback or Porcelio levis orange. And... I don't know. Maybe maybe zebra pill bugs, Armadillidium maculatum. I don't know though because honestly, I could easily pick thirty more that are also my favorites. So, for what that's worth, um, they're just—it's hard to pick a favorite because they're so fantastic, you know. Well, I probably better wrap up now. Hopefully, I got all the questions as much as possible that I could get. Thank you to the patrons for sending in the questions on Patreon. I appreciate that. And uh, thank you for everyone to, for joining in. And we will catch you next time. Have a video coming out on Friday as usual. And hope to see you all next time. Stay healthy and stay safe.